Today we're on a mission to figure out exactly what happened to every number one NFL draft pick from the 2000s. Now it's becoming more and more clear by the year that any draft pick can be that diamond in the rough that a team is looking for. Whereas in basketball, the number one pick has a much better chance of turning out to be the best player. That's not always the case in football since there's so many more rounds to go through. Stick around because I guarantee we're going to bring back some memories in this video that you completely forgot about. We're going to kick it off with the 2000 NFL Draft. The Cleveland Browns were on the clock after finishing the 1999 season with a 2-14 record. This team needed help at almost every single position at the time. I'll be honest with you, the only names that you're probably going to recognize from that roster are Tim Couch, because how are you going to forget a guy whose name is a piece of furniture, and Phil Dawson who is a kicker, and for some reason, that's the name that I remember most. With the Browns at number one, they took Courtney Brown in an attempt to beef up their defense, seeing as they gave up 27.3 points per game the year prior. Coming out of Penn State, he had all the abilities that scouts usually look for. He was pretty quick for a defensive end, had the size standing in at 6 feet 4 inches tall and 285 pounds, and showed throughout his college career that he could perform well, being named as the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year in the 1999 season, along with being a consensus All-American. He did start off looking very promising though during his rookie season, but after that, things began to decline quickly for him. For some reason, Brown just couldn't stay healthy. Starting in his second season, knee and ankle injuries began to take a toll on him and his performance. Sometimes things like that just happen in the NFL. You're playing one of the most physically demanding sports in the world every single week. Some players just get hurt way more than others, which is unfortunate. From 2002 to 2004, Brown was only able to get on the field for 26 total games and recorded just eight sacks during that time. Once it was clear that he was not going to be able to get healthy enough, the Browns decided to cut their losses and release him. During the 2005 offseason, Brown decided to sign with the Broncos, where he didn't perform up to their standards either, and he was cut after the season was over, ultimately ending his NFL career. Since retirement, Brown has certainly not spent much time in the spotlight, as it was very hard for me to figure out what he's actually been up to these days. I did see something that said he has been doing missionary work in the Dominican Republic, but I can't confirm 100% if that's true or not, since he doesn't have any social media. Now, 2001 was quite a different story. This was a complete roller coaster ride of a draft pick. The Falcons needed a piece that could turn around this entire franchise, so what better choice than a quarterback? They had three quarterbacks on their roster during the 2000 season Chris Chandler, Danny Cannell, and Doug Johnson. Some of you watching might not have heard of any of those guys, but Chandler actually led them to a 14-2 season in 1998, along with getting them all the way to the Super Bowl before losing to the Broncos 34-19. The problem was, now he was in his mid-30s, and most seasons didn't follow the same path for Chandler. It was kind of a one-season deal where they were really good, and then after that, not so much. So the Falcons decided to go with Michael Vick out of Virginia Tech. This dude, when he was healthy was nothing short of a video game character with how he ran the football and he had the potential in my eyes to be top 10 in terms of greatest players ever he started off his career by backing up chris chandler in the 2001 season but after a mediocre 7 and 9 season the falcons decided to give him the keys to the cadillac once he got those keys in 2002 it was like a whole new engine was unlocked for that car Vic ran for 777 yards on the year, led the league with an average of 6.9 yards per attempt and totaled 24 touchdowns on the season, leading the Falcons to a 9-6-1 record before losing to the Eagles in the divisional round. After an unfortunate injury where he broke his leg in a meaningless preseason game, Vic picked up right where he left off in 2004, leading the Falcons to an 11-5 record running for 902 yards and once again leading the league in yards per attempt at 7.5. He continued that level of play through the 2006 season where he became the first quarterback in NFL history to rush for 1,000 yards in a single season. But just when everything was looking up for him, Vic made the worst decision of his entire career that would ultimately ruin his image. 2007, Vic was suspended indefinitely after pleading guilty to a dogfighting scheme where bets would be placed on who would win. As you can imagine, this disgusting behavior was met with a hefty suspension for two years. But a lot of people believe he never should have played football again. 
Once he did come back, the Eagles took a chance on him, and you know who their coach was at that time? Good old Andy Reid. So if you like the Chiefs, you can't really be complaining too much about this one. You know Coach Reid is a good guy at heart. Vic did end up somewhat reviving his career in Philly for just two seasons in 2010 and 2011, even being selected to the Pro Bowl in 2010 along with winning the Comeback Player of the Year award. Once his time with the Eagles was over though, his career was pretty much over. In 2014, he ended up on the Jets, not doing too much with them, and then on the Steelers in 2015, only playing in five games because Ben Roethlisberger was injured during that time. Honestly, things could have gone a lot differently for Vic if he'd never got involved in that whole dogfighting mess, but bad decisions like that are going to come back to haunt you in ways that you could never imagine. At the end of his career, Vic had four Pro Bowl appearances to his name. Since stepping back from football in 2016, Vic has done many different activities. Most notably, he has been doing commentary work for Fox Sports as an NFL analyst. Moving on to 2002, the Texans decided to follow a similar route in selecting a quarterback with pick number one, except this didn't quite turn out the same for them as it would the Falcons. To be fair though, out of all the quarterbacks in this draft class, none of them really amounted to too much, so there was no perfect choice. Houston took David Carr, hoping that he would be able to turn this team around and lead them to some success. That did not happen. Of course, the blame is going to all fall onto a quarterback in a situation like this, but their offensive line didn't do him any favors either. Out of his five seasons with the team, Carr led the league in getting sacked three of those, which means those guys either weren't doing their job well enough or Carr was just holding onto the ball too long. It seemed to me like it was a mix of both. The best thing about his time with Houston was in 2006 when he surprisingly led the league in completion percentage, but that didn't really help the team too much and after that he was off to Carolina. With the Panthers, he only played in six total games and finished with a starting record of 1-3 during his time there. Following his run with the Panthers, Carr didn't start in a single game again in his career. He got in games here and there, but for the most part, the teams he went to already had their starting quarterbacks in place. Carr did end up getting himself a ring, though, as a part of the New York Giants after they took down the Patriots in the 2012 Super Bowl. After retiring, Carr has joined NFL Network as an analyst, but some of his takes are a bit out there to say the least. He did just recently say that Jalen Hurts should be benched for Marcus Mariota last season. I don't know if I quite agree with that one. As for 2003 goes, the Bengals were on the clock coming off a 2-14 season, where John Kitna, Akili Smith, and Gus Farratt were the quarterbacks on roster. Clearly, that situation wasn't working out too great, so they drafted the best quarterback on the board in Carson Palmer. Unlike most number one picks, Palmer didn't actually play at all during his rookie season. Instead, he learned the ins and outs of the position at the NFL level during games and in practice. Once they did give him a shot in 2004, it was a bit shaky with Palmer throwing just as many interceptions as touchdowns, but that appeared to be exactly what he needed because in the 2005 season, everything turned around. Palmer led the Bengals to an 11-5 record along with leading the league in touchdowns and completion percentage. This was enough to earn himself the first Pro Bowl nod of his career and the Bengals truly had a chance at making a playoff run. Their wildcard game matchup that year was against the Pittsburgh Steelers, and sadly, disaster struck on just the second snap for Cincinnati, with Palmer tearing his ACL. Now, the Bengals went on to lose that game, but the franchise was still very hopeful for his future. He made some noise during his comeback season, yet again making the Pro Bowl, but things began going downhill for him after 2006. In 2007, Palmer threw for over 4,000 yards, which might seem good, but he also led the league in interceptions thrown and then was injured yet again in 2008 after starting the season 0-4. For the rest of his time in Cincinnati, they couldn't make it past the wildcard game, and Palmer ended up being traded to the Raiders in 2011. The same type of play continued while he was with Oakland until he ended up on the Cardinals in 2013. Then, something magical happened. His career completely turned around. Although they didn't make the playoffs in his first year at quarterback for the Cardinals, he led them to a 10-6 record, which was a huge turnaround compared to the previous season where they finished just 5-11. Now Palmer did have some much-needed star power to help him along the way by the names of Larry Fitzgerald, Prime Patrick Peterson at the time on defense, and a couple more. But if the quarterback play is bad, then the whole team is just dysfunctional and nothing's going to work, so Palmer did his job very well. 
In the following season, by the time Week 10 rolled around, Palmer and the Cardinals were smooth sailing with a record of 7-1, until yet again, Arizona's chances were destroyed as Palmer tore his ACL against the Rams in the fourth quarter. He was a fighter though and came back just one season later to lead them to a 13-3 record, leading the league in QBR along with leading the league in game-winning drives. He was clutch. He was everything that Cardinals fans wanted him to be that year, and they looked great. But something was off late in that season. They snuck by the Packers in the divisional round of the playoffs and then got blown out of the water by the Panthers in the NFC Championship game. Yet again, Palmer was dealing with an injury that he was downplaying. Later confirmed by Larry Fitzgerald, a right index finger dislocation would be the cause of the Cardinals' downfall that season. And that pretty much sums up Palmer's whole career right there. When he was fully healthy, he could hang with the best of them and be a great quarterback. But injuries took a massive toll on his body, and at the end of the day, the job was never fully completed. After losing in the playoffs to the Panthers in that 2015-16 season, Palmer played just two more years with the Cardinals before retiring from the league, finishing with three Pro Bowl appearances and a lot of what-ifs for Cincinnati and Arizona fans. Nowadays, Palmer spends his time being a busy father to his children in Sun Valley, Idaho, likes to spend his time fishing and hunting. He also teamed up with an Idaho campaign dedicated to healing children diagnosed with cancer called Camp Rainbow Gold. Moving on to 2004, there wouldn't need to be any what-ifs from this quarterback's fan base by the time his career was over. Eli Manning was taken first overall by the Chargers, but traded on draft night to the New York Giants because he refused to play for San Diego due to him being worried about their organization at the time. Now, Manning started off his career a bit slow, but that's pretty normal for rookies to dip their feet into the water before completely diving in and playing well. By year two, Eli was looking a lot more comfortable in the offense, and things began to click with them finishing 11-5. Although they got skunked in the first round of the playoffs by the Panthers, the Giants' future was looking bright, and that was confirmed when they took down the Patriots in the 2008 Super Bowl. This was a complete miracle for the Giants. Eli finished the regular season with the most interceptions in the league, and they still managed to take down the greatest football player that we've seen to date, in Tom Brady. David Tyree's helmet catch made this Super Bowl an instant classic, but Eli and the Giants weren't done there. They would be back to the Super Bowl yet again in 2012 against none other than Tom Brady and the Patriots. This was a very similar storyline to 2008 as the Giants willed their way back into this game from a 9-17 deficit to overcome the Patriots. The NFC East was really Brady's kryptonite if you look back at it, and you can thank mostly Eli Manning for that. After that Super Bowl victory, Eli seemed to have used up all his magic wishes because he would once again lead the league in interceptions and the Giants started playing worse and worse. Wishes well spent though, I must say, because anytime you can beat Brady, it's definitely worth it. Manning made one more Pro Bowl in the 2015 season before calling it a career in 2020. I have to say, sometimes Eli would look goofy, he would make decisions here and there where all you could really do was just shake your head, but at the end of the day, Eli did exactly what the Giants needed him to do. Go out there and win football games when it mattered the most in those two Super Bowls. Eli will always be known as a Giants legend, and I want to know your opinions in the comments section below. Do you think that he did enough? To become a Hall of Famer. Since retiring, Eli has been super busy working with multiple brands such as Corona, is half of the Manning cast that airs on ESPN during Monday Night Football games, and is apparently looking to get into some ownership in sports teams in the future. 2005 was yet another wild up and down journey, and your captain of this trip went by the name of Alex Smith. He was selected number one overall by the San Francisco 49ers, and his career got off to an atrocious start. One touchdown thrown and 11 interceptions for Smith in his rookie season had to leave fans wondering how in the hell they picked this guy. Was Smith a bad pick or what exactly was happening here? Now I know I said rookies usually struggle, but not that badly. After that start, people began questioning if he was going to actually last in the NFL, and if he did, would it be for that long? He did, however, come back with a better performance in his second season, but it was still clear that he wasn't playing at the level that the Niners needed him to. The following season, Smith would run into his first physical obstacle of many. 
separating his AC joint in his shoulder and being shut down after playing in just seven games. He would then break a bone in the same shoulder before the next year began, causing him to miss all of the 2008 season as well. Once he did return, Smith actually played much better. Even though he dealt with some more injuries along the way, when he was on the field, things were going well for the team. His best year with the Niners came in 2011, where they finished 13-3 before losing to the Giants in the NFC Championship game. After yet another season of him suffering an injury in 2012, the 49ers traded Smith to the Chiefs. This paired him up with Andy Reid, and it was also where Smith played his best overall football. The greatest part about this whole experience for him in Kansas City was that he was finally fully healthy. He led the Chiefs to a positive record every single season with the team, even making three Pro Bowl appearances. But sadly, they just couldn't get the job done when it mattered most in the playoffs. Following the 2017 season, Smith was shipped off to the Redskins where he faced the biggest challenge imaginable. In a game against the Houston Texans on November 18th, he was tackled by Kareem Jackson and J.J. Watt in the backfield. What at first seemed like a normal sack turned into the biggest battle of Smith's career. He had broken his tibia and fibula during that play. This injury was much more than meets the eye. Even though it was absolutely disgusting to look at, Smith had to go through 17 different surgeries, his leg at one point turned black, and he was diagnosed with a flesh-eating disease called necrotizing fasciitis. And just when it seemed like all hope was completely lost, like Alex Smith would never play professional football again, the unthinkable happened. He fought and fought and eventually returned to the league in the 2020 season, winning the Comeback Player of the Year award and finishing off his career on a positive note as an absolute warrior. Hats off to Alex Smith for being one of the strongest and most dedicated athletes that I personally have ever seen. After concluding his NFL career, Smith joined ESPN as an NFL analyst for SportsCenter and Monday Night Countdown, and this poor guy had to deal with his daughter having a brain tumor that took multiple surgeries to be removed. Now for 2006, we had our second defender taken at number one, and it would be by the Houston Texans. They decided to go with defensive end Mario Williams out of NC State. He was extremely strong, fast for his position, and of course, had a knack for getting pressure on the quarterback. There was a big debate on whether Reggie Bush should have actually went number one overall, but at the end of the day, the Texans decided not to go with him due to quote-unquote character issues. Williams still turned out great for Houston, though. In just his second season, he had an outstanding year, blowing every other Texans defender out of the water in terms of sacks on that season, and even scoring one-third of the team's total defensive touchdowns. He followed that up with two straight Pro Bowl seasons before Williams began to miss some time. After getting hurt in 2011 and being placed on injured reserve, Mario became a free agent during the offseason. Once all the dust had settled, Williams ended up on the Buffalo Bills where he would continue to play at a dominant level. Even though he made two more Pro Bowls during his time with Buffalo, they never did have what it took to make a good run. In fact, the Bills never even made the playoffs while Williams was a part of that roster, which sucked to see. After the 2015 season was over, he was a free agent once again and surprisingly made his way onto the Dolphins, who are one of the Bills' division rivals. Williams signed a two-year contract with them in the offseason, but would only play one of those out before being released and retiring from the NFL. Since retiring, Williams has just been really focused on spending more time with his children. There was one incident in 2019 where Williams apparently broke into his ex's house and was arrested for that, but she later stated that she wanted those charges to be dropped and he was ultimately hit with a misdemeanor. 2007 was a unique case. This was one of the biggest busts in NFL history. Jamarcus Russell was taken first overall. He was a beast in college at LSU, had abilities that you simply just couldn't teach as a coach. Scouts loved his arm strength and size at the quarterback position, but unfortunately the Raiders had the number one pick who around the time just kept making the wrong decision. Raiders owner at the time, Al Davis, insisted that they draft Russell and that he would be a savior to that franchise, while on the other hand, the head coach at the time, Lane Kiffin, wanted them to draft future Hall of Fame wide receiver Calvin Johnson. Hindsight is 2020, and Megatron at the end of the day was a much, much better pick. 
Russell immediately started off his career on a sour note, holding out all of training camp and into the first week of the season because he wanted a better rookie contract. Even though Russell and the Raiders did finally come to a deal, he still only entered into four games during his rookie season and didn't play too great. As we talked about a lot in this video though, a lot of the times rookies are going to struggle and then bounce back during their second season. This was sort of the case with Russell as he played a bit better, but not too great. Finishing the 2008 season with 2,423 yards, 13 touchdowns, and 8 interceptions. The really off-putting stat was his 12 fumbles on the season. We gotta hold on to that football out there. But the fumbles would become the least of the Raiders' problems with Russell starting in 2009. Jamarcus's uncle and father figure ended up passing away from heart disease in April, and then in July, another one of his uncles passed from a heart attack, which really caused him to spiral out of control. By the beginning of the season, all that grieving in the offseason caused Russell to weigh in at 305 pounds, and he was clearly not ready to play football, both mentally and physically. This showed when he finished the 2009 season with a starting record of 2-7, throwing for just 3 touchdowns and 11 interceptions. Oakland by that point had enough of Russell and he was released in the offseason. That would end up being the last time anybody saw Jamarcus Russell play in the NFL. After his NFL journey was over, Russell did try to make a comeback to several teams but could never make it back on a roster. In 2018, he started working for Williamson High School as a quarterback's coach hoping to mold young athletes there into future NFL players. In 2008, the Miami Dolphins were on the clock at pick number one, and they decided to beef up their offensive line with Jake Long. This turned out to be a great pick for them, as he would start off his career with four straight Pro Bowl appearances, along with an All-Pro appearance during the 2009 season. Long also became the highest paid offensive lineman in history at that time, agreeing to a five-year, $57.5 million deal with the Dolphins. During his rookie season, Long gave up just two and a half sacks on the entire year. I saw this one thread on Reddit asking if he could be considered as a bust. That makes zero sense to me because Long was one of, if not the best left tackles in all of football during his time with Miami. Now, after his time with the Dolphins was over, that argument might make a little more sense because he was injured so much, but I don't really think you can put that blame all on him. I do wish I could talk about long for longer, but offensive linemen's jobs aren't too, too flashy. Go out there and stop the defender from getting to your quarterback, which is exactly what he did. He did his job very well when he was healthy. Since retiring, Long has spent most of his time just being with his two children. And rounding things off, in 2009, the Detroit Lions were on the clock after an embarrassing 0-16 season the year prior. They needed a change at the helm and needed it badly, so they went and drafted quarterback Matthew Stafford, number one overall out of Georgia. Things didn't instantly begin looking great for Detroit, though, once he was drafted as he went on to miss six games during his rookie season due to various knee and shoulder injuries, along with throwing 20 interceptions in the 10 games that he did play in. Then once again in 2010, he hurt his shoulder, which ultimately ended his season after playing in just three total games. Stafford did not give up though, as he went on to win the Comeback Player of the Year award in 2011 and led the Lions to a much improved record of 10-6, along with throwing for over 5,000 yards that season. Detroit was leaning heavily on Stafford to turn this franchise around, probably more than any other team in the NFL since he consistently finished towards the league lead in attempts per game. Although his time in Detroit didn't lead to any playoff success for the Lions, Stafford and Calvin Johnson saved this team from being a complete disgrace in the early 2010s. In 2014, Stafford made his first Pro Bowl and led the league in game-winning drives and fourth-quarter comebacks. Another thing I noticed when taking a look back at the stats is that in 2016, Stafford led the Lions to a 9-7 record, and you might be thinking, okay, that's pretty mediocre. But the amazing part is that eight of those games were won on game-winning drives led by Stafford. That's pretty remarkable. This man was clutch and heavily underrated due to their lack of playoff success and overall pieces around him. It wasn't until 2021 where Stafford finally found himself on a team that had a real shot of winning it all, the Los Angeles Rams. He was teamed up with players like Aaron Donald, Jalen Ramsey, and they even went out and got Von Miller at the trade deadline to make this defense an absolute powerhouse and make that push for a title. 
Cooper Cup emerged as one of the best receivers in the NFL that year due to his connection with Stafford on the offensive end, and he made the most of his only Super Bowl appearance of his career, beating the Bengals by a final score of 23 to 20. Stafford is the only player on this list that is still playing to this day, and he just recently led the Rams to yet another playoff appearance along with making his second Pro Bowl on a team that was counted out by almost everybody before the season even started. Multiple sources had the Rams finishing below five wins for the entire season, but Stafford just keeps proving the haters wrong. Now, if you guys enjoyed this video, maybe check out these ones as well. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more NFL content.